Okay, um, yes. Then, yeah, welcome to the CASA Distinguished Lecture from uh, Ahmad Zadegi. In Hardware We Trust, the Struggle, Challenges, and Future of Trusted Computing. So welcome, Ahmad. And I think I do not need to introduce Ahmad in detail because I think everyone who's attending also knows Ahmad. He is a full professor of computer science at TU Darmstadt. He's leading the system security lab. So basically working in a very similar area than I'm uh, working. And he has a, yeah, 20, 30 years of experience of doing top level research. One of the best cited people in Germany in computer security. He has received many awards, among them an Intel Academic Le a Leadership Award at USENIX last year. Then he received an ACM SIGSAC Outstanding Contributions Award in 2018 and many others. So if you work in computer security, you know all the work that Ahmad and his crew have published in the past 20 years. So it's an honor to have you here. Welcome. Okay. So do you hear me? Yes. So I hope thanks a lot, uh, uh, Torsten. Uh, maybe I just share my screen first um, and then see if it works. Uh, do you see it? Yes, we can see you. So let, no, I mean, see the slides. We see the slides, yes. Mm -hmm. So I hope that it is full screen slide and uh, there is no uh, big margins. Okay, is that okay, the picture? Yes. Okay, so thanks a lot for, for the invitation. It, it feels like I come back home uh, because I, I used to uh, be in Bochum, actually one of the first people who started in Bochum with Horskost uh, uh, Institute for IT uh, Sicherheit together with Christoph Parr. And as I left, um, the Honorable Torsten uh, came after me and uh, took the best office, the corner office. And this is a running gag, I always uh, joke that I was mentioned to all our friends or common friends and colleagues that uh, I even didn't, I, I just sat maybe one week in that uh, office, but Torsten had a pleasure to um, yeah to use it for some years anyway this um, talk is a collection of a series of talks that i always update whenever there is something new on the market regarding to trusted computing we are not only doing trusted computing but this is one of the areas i really uh, would say uh, uh, thank my my career to it so i i really um, um, appreciate following this area as one of the first groups in, in Europe and trying to catch up with this um, technology that was uh, started with an idea and then got uh, sparked in, in, within industry. So this is why I took this uh, title in Hardware We Trust and we will talk about this uh, in the course of the talk. What does it mean in Hardware We Trust and what can we do for it? Before I start, I want to make an ad because my uh, uh, team was uh, uh, pushing us, also my, my collaborators. We have a, a very amazing workshop for the second time. It's called High Tech Women in Science and Technology with very distinguished uh, lecturers. And I would encourage uh, you, all of you, it's not only for, for women, but uh, all the speakers are, are females. Uh, I would really encourage you to participate. You can see the link uh, where you register and it is uh, next week. It is a hybrid and we have only, I think, four or five uh, places for uh, seats that we are allowed to provide to participants. The rest is virtual. So sorry for this uh, advertisement uh, pause. So what is the trusted computing uh, and what is actually the philosophy behind it? So I, I, I really want to sell it in this talk to you ideas and, and uh, a piece of history and my experience of the last, let's say, 20 years with a number of industrial partners from a small one to very, very large ones, but also in academic research and many, many amazing collaborators, amongst others, Torsten Holtz, uh, who are doing a really f fascinating job in, in this area. This is a very dynamic area. So the philosophy of trusted computing is to verify whether or not a computing system or a collection of computing systems behave as expected. 
So this is actually a very general solution, very general uh, 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 explanation of, of the philosophy. And as you can see, this is not uh, provided by engineers because then it would be much more concrete. It is provided by uh, lawyers because anything would fall under it. Even a, a virus, a computer worm or a Trojan, they also behave as expected. So just be careful when, uh, because there are four more than, I think 15,000 pages of specifications on trusted computing in practice, what the industry wants to do. And uh, this, so to say term, this, this explanation of the philosophy, you may see it here and there, but this is behind all the things that are written because of patent regulations, because of many, many financial interests when more than 200 IT companies are involved and 100,000 papers that are produced in academic area on this technology. So what is the dream of trusted computing? So those of you who are Star Trek fan, you may know Vija. It's one of the nicest, uh, so to say, episodes of, of uh, Star Trek, um, so to say, um, science fiction uh, movie. And so you see this, this amazing uh, uh, kind of very complex and scary looking uh, creature, which is called Vija. And in the center of it, I put just TPM, but it is around the uh, trusted computing idea. This is a kind of creature that can do anything. It is very advanced. It is made by advanced aliens, but in the center of it, it's the Voyager, one of the first satellites sent to the Earth. If we have time at the end, I will tell you the story behind it, why I put it. So the dream is to sell to you, to us, really trustworthy systems that function correctly, always correctly, and they are sustainable. Making it more realistic, the purpose of trusted computing is in a system security manner, if you see that uh, abstraction of a system from hardware to operating system and applications. And there is a typical function of operating system that provides a certain soft isolation among the, the applications. So the idea is to put something, or I just abstracted, something which is called trust anchor. It doesn't have to be in hardware. It doesn't have to be in software. It could be in combination of that. I just put it in hardware because of folklore belief in, in computer science and in engineering that hardware is hard to uh, attack or at least much harder than you can attack the software because accessing the state of the hardware needs requires much more effort than accessing the state in software as long as it is not of course in the secure hardware or stored in the secure hardware so this is an abstraction and this trust anchor means we have a small set of and there is no proof no formal proof what is the minimum set of security features and primitives that you need to put together so that you can add this component, this trust anchor into a commodity system, into a, a typical system that all of us are using. And then using this small set of uh, security primitives, you can build security guarantees that are more complex than those small sets. So, this is the, the idea, and, and if you can uh, uh, implement this in reality, in, in practice, then you have a very beautiful stuff, like, for example, let me see if I can uh, do my, yeah, my laser pointer. I think there is a laser pointer when I see there. Anyway, no, I don't. Okay, so you can see here, for example, that you can have uh, isolated execution, you can have isolated means if it is in hardware, it is hardware supported isolation between these applications. You can verify platform integrity, which is called a remote attestation in general. So remotely, you can, you can check if a platform has changed the, uh, the, the critical state. Uh, you can provide secure storage. You can provide the device identification and device authentication capabilities. And the range of, uh, and one of the things that, uh, okay, I think no, nothing works. Okay. 
And I think one of the uh, main point of the research was always, how do I implement this trust anchor? And there is a big range of it going from a trusted platform module. Maybe you have uh, heard about it, some of you and some of you definitely who are uh, doing research in Bochum uh, anyway, um, from a cryptographic coprocessor, which is, which is connected over bus to a, a CPU or to SOC, so system on chip, to one of the most sophisticated security extension of a commercial off the shelf CPU by Intel, which is called software guard extension. So we're going to go through it uh, fast. So how is the landscape? You see a number of names here on the, uh, on the screen. I'm going to uh, classify that. These names are those systems that are, for example, by industry or proposed by academic uh, research, which have, so to say, in the core, this idea and philo philosophy of trusted computing. So you have a trust anchor of some kind, you assume that this trust anchor is trusted, as it says, the name says, so it explains it, and it is immune against attack. So this is your assumption. We will come to assumptions later, but just to landscape. So there's industry solutions from an IBM crypto cards, which are very, very old, to enter SGX or recently Intel TDX, you see it here. here. So two other uh, architectures are race, race five architectures. So TPM is meanwhile, although the new versions are coming up, uh, uh, the, the TPM is meanwhile very old. So now from within this uh, 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 landscape, there are of course, some of the designs are for mobile and embedded systems. Some of them provide isolated hardware supported execution uh, environment. So really uh, it is so to say strong isolation of applications, for example, or, or code, trusted code and untrusted code. And um, some of them are capability based, for example, like Cherry, uh, which is by University of Cambridge. And I don't know how many years these guys are working on that. Very nice, I think if, if you have time and you, you can, put effort in, in, in such an uh, uh, interesting way of uh, building hardware. Capability-based, very simply said, it defines policies, for example, for, uh, for memory protection in the hardware, yeah? so very low level. And Cherry is also kind of inspired a lot of design in ARM Trust Zone, which is of course on millions of, of devices. So it is an impactful work. I'm just making some cynical jokes about it. But, um, and then there are systems that are deployed, really deployed outside like Intel SGX or hardware assisted secure boot. In, 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 nearly every system has, has that, that uh, this kind of secure boot, for example, all mobile systems. And, um, and then there are new directions that we are going to talk about. It's for example, RISC-V. As you see here, there are some Keystone from Berkeley, Sanctum from MIT, a Cure from Darmstadt, Hector 5, which is actually a secure processor rather than, but, but based on uh, RISC 5, which is a new one uh, by Graz, Timber 5 by Graz and TU Darmstadt. This is a my group, uh, the work of my group, and Hex 5 and Multizone. These are, so to say, more commercial industrial products based on RISC 5. And here you see also a number of uh, uh, embedded, uh, 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 so to say, trusted computing architectures, like, for example, I don't know, Smart from University of Irvine. Titan uh, and, and uh, Titan is uh, Darmstadt, uh, Trustlight is Darmstadt, Intel, Sanctuary is also Darmstadt, Sankos is KU Leuven. Um, and so there are a number of uh, people working on these uh, architectures. And if there is something missing on this slide, please do not be unhappy. And you may ha um, have read a paper that is not here or you are the co-author of that paper. So do not be sad because this slide has limited space. Okay, so, and then of course, because of side channel attacks that we're going to talk about, and I call them software side channel attacks, there are systems that try to guarantee side channel protection, yeah? So, given this landscape, I would like to just concentrate on enclave computing, which I call enclave computing, enclave or enclave, we will talk about it. It is about reducing the trusted computing base. And here, the first thing that we need is to have a security architectures that provides us with secure containers, so to say, or trusted execution environment 
that is realized, implemented through enclaves. And enclaves are, so to say, in general, should be black box. Nobody can look into them. Yeah. So enclaves are really a prominent approach for protecting sensitive services. So again, we come back to the abstract picture of our system, if you have operating system and applications. Our trust model, our adversary model says no software is trusted. Yeah. So that means we have sensitive services, a cryptographic algorithms, or you want to sign something, or a, a, a machine learning algorithm, you want to protect the, the weights and the parameters, they are running in the so-called en en enclaves or enclaves. I just, I just used enclaves, like service A and B. And of course, the isolated execution environment, it's backed by hardware. So by system on chip is of course extended. And to communicate with hardware, you still need some part of trusted software, but this software must be very, very small. So that configures the security mechanisms, for example, uh, allows that whenever OS, the, the community OS, which is not trusted, wants to access something, this goes through this trusted software. And trusted software indeed assigns uh, resources to these enclaves, like memory cores, uh, CPU cores, and caches. So let us take, uh, say, take uh, as a case study, Intel Software Guard extension, SGX, which I uh, call them the reincarnation. So SGX needed around 15 years of development because when you develop such things in a company, I cannot talk about all the uh, uh, stuff related to SGX because they are not published, but in, in, in general, um, it is a very sophisticated security extension of, of, a, you know, of a commercial uh, uh, CPU. It is not a specific security CPU. So, and there are lots of politics behind, of industrial politics behind this development coming from TPM and still TPM to SG. I'll talk about here, but maybe in a lecture one day, Torsten invites me or Christopher invites me to Bochum. A whole day, I can tell you about stories that are very, very interesting. I can write a book about it. So, SGX was a celebrity and then became a victim. And then finally, it is trying to be reborn. So this is why I call it the incarnation of, of uh, SGX. And we will see why. So some basis of SGX, I think many of you know it. I just repeat it for those because those who are, who are not familiar with it, because I would like to interest you for this topic because it is fascinating, at least from my point of view. So you have applications. And at the application level, SGX provides you with guarantees like I can give you a secure hardware protected memory that you can run your, your code in it and nobody else can look into it. Not the operating system, not the rest of your app or other threads that are you're running. And even some of, the, some of the peripherals and some of the hardware uh, attacks would not work. So what we are not going towards the hardware. What we are talking about here is only software attacks. So, because when you go to really hardware attacks where you start to measure the electromagnetic aspects, uh, uh, current, voltage, all the side channel community, which is also very strong in Bochum, um, we are just put them out. Yeah, we will come to that at the end if you have questions, but let's just talk about software because software attacks, remote attacks on, uh, from software, that is cool. All security people want to do that. Yeah? So we want to do cool stuff first, but hardware attacks are even cooler if you know how to do it. So now let's say uh, um, we forget about the hardware. Now, a bit more details about SGX is that as you can see here, you have different CPU cores. On a, on a CPU core, you have, uh, let's say, two threads, uh, simultaneous multi-threading, you have caches and buffers, uh, like any CPU, you have a device key, and this device key is called, uh, I mean, you have a root provisioning and root uh, scaling key, provisioning key you need for other keys, we will come to that. And then you have these enclaves and each enclave has its own key. What is important here is something which is called quoting enclave, which has an attestation key. That means a kind of signing key, that assures other components inside or outside the platform that they are genuine enclaves. 
So if this enclave wants to talk to this enclave, how do they know that they are really genuine enclaves that are connected somehow, related, abstractly seen? There is a cryptographic chain between their existence, which is the code, to a cryptographic key. So for that, this coding enclave is like a like a central, yeah, it's, it's completely centralized. And as you see here, there is a, there is a cloud which is interlinked between. That means to to provision to provide this key to a quoting enclave, there is a procedure, which is here very simply shown by this cloud, which is more complicated than that, which also provides, a, this is an Intel server, Intel cloud, that you have to do it to have a proof that this key is confirmed by, uh, by Intel, and it is connected somehow to this key, yeah, which is a device key that is delivered with the device. You do not generate it your, yourself. You may be able in the future. I will come to that later if you have time. All right. And time is running very fast. But we started five minutes late. So anyway, um, when we have this uh, architecture, then you see that the dependency of Intel, this is also a research question. How can we reduce the dependency on the vendor? But this is another point. OK. Having this architecture, let us talk about leakage in Intel uh, SGX. It is an underestimated threat. And why I, I say that? Because leakage, information leakage, was completely outside the STX adversary model. Why? Very simple. Because if you have enclaves and applications, and in, in, a, in SGX, you have a memory which is devoted, physical memory which is devoted to the enclaves, and then you share the environment, it is clear to everyone who is doing security that shared environment means that, for example, these enclaves, so your, your sharing environment memory, it's a shared medium. medium. So, and then when you have uh, attacks like prime and probe, which is a very old techniques to understand, for example, the timing accesses, that, the, the timing access of memory between an application which is the adversary and the enclave which should be actually, which should give us pro protection guarantees. Enclaves is black box. So there is everything is, is encrypted, everything is. So these accesses, the access pattern delivers as many researchers show and I'll show you some of them, um, uh, would deliver, would leak information, which is very important, uh, sensitive information. So this is no surprise that people start academia as the SGS came out, academia jumped on it and produced one paper after each other. And then Intel guys were saying, what's the point? This is outside our uh, adversary model. So let's see some uh, examples. So here we have an enclave. This is our target. We, and this is the, the adversary. We have a number of resources. So as soon as the state of the CPU or the state of caches or any other shared uh, memory is delivered or, or leaked from abstract point of view to a unprivileged software, which is here a user space ad uh, adversary, then we are done with the attack. So, and now Let's go through some of these attacks. So you, have, you, you see also internal, I call them the internal buffers or internal caches of, of the uh, CPU. Like for example, branch prediction, which is uh, very important. It, is, uh, it's, it just holds information about branches. So one of the, I just provide here, not all attacks, some of the most cited attacks and some of the very early attacks, which were, I think, important. So they use CPU uh, uh, internal caches to understand the control flow of the, for example, RSA, RSA uh, uh, code running into the, in, in the enclave. And for that, they need to interrupt the enclave many, many, many times to capture all the branches, yeah? As soon as you have the control flow of the algorithm, you can, kind of leak a lot of information about, because they are key independent about the RSA key and they could recover the whole RSA key. Another attack, which was also interesting, but uses kind of 
let's say other internal uh, um, uh, buffers of, of, of the CPU is this one that is also looks for control flow. Then another uh, uh, attack, which is now, uh, or as a set of attacks that are now using the caches. As you see, we have cache level one, cache level two, depending on the access uh, uh, time, and cache level three, and depending in Intel architecture, we have level one, level two, and level three. And level three, as you see, is the most uh, the slowest one. So these attacks started to at use the cache, the shared uh, memory, so to say, and use uh, techniques like prime and probe that I don't want to explain now, but it's very simple to uh, look at it. At least the principle is very simple. On, for example, L1 cache, the fastest cache, to detect a, a, um, AES key. But also here, in these two attacks where they do prime and probe to extract the keys, they need to interrupt, as at least in this one, they need to in interrupt uh, the enclave. But then people thought, okay, there are measures that, I mean, protection me measures that see, or oh, the enclave is interrupted too much, then terminate. So it's a protection mechanism. We need a stealthy attack. So this one here tries to use, again, the standard techniques to extract the key, but without interrupting the enclave, However, they make some assumptions like the enclave and uh, the attacker. So that means this attacker software and the enclave are kind of synchronized, which is two strong assumptions for real world. Yeah, don't forget these techniques need a lot of work because they, you need to, to filter the noise in a realistic system where hundreds of process, processes are, are running to have a successful side channel attack. Now, this is an attack and I want to brag about it because it is from us. And uh, um, why is that interesting? And, uh, and we even didn't think that it will be accepted at any conference because once the attack, some attack is, is out and once everybody knows that uh, side channel attacks, uh, SCX is vulnerable to side channel attacks. So what's the point about it? This was actually an exercise which became a scientific paper where you don't need to interrupt any enclave you don't need any synchronization and you do not only extract the keys, but also you extract secret information or privacy preserve, privacy sensitive information from the enclave where a, 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 a genetic or a genetic sequencing uh, algorithm that is used by FBI to identify certain DNAs. So we could find a match without even uh, knowing what is running in the, uh, I mean, without accessing the information inside the enclave just by uh, cache side channel leakage. It was a tough work at the end, but it was very interesting. And there are also is even other fascinating work where people hide the code that is doing prime and probe attack, for example, on um, L L3 cache by hiding the code in one enclave because operating system doesn't know anything about this code in the enclave because enclave is protecting that code. And this enclave is kind of spying on the other enclave. This is of course also a very nice idea. I like this paper as well. It's not from us, but I like it. So uh, a joke aside. So now these were cache side channel attacks, which as I said, was obvious that you can do that. And some people did it, they got their papers and everybody is happy, okay? Do we go home? No, there is other problem. And that's the ghost in my CPU. And I misused the quote by Vladimir Putin, yeah? Where he says, there is no happiness in the world, but only a spectre of it. So I just changed it to, there is no secure CPU, only a spectre of it. And that's the message that we have lots of work to do. Industry has lots of work to do still for future computing systems. So, and this is where all these transient executions and the so-called, what I call them cross-layer attacks come, come out. What does it mean? Software exploitable hardware vulnerabilities. So that means we are going to exploit hardware vulnerabilities, which could be an implementation error, or it could be a design error, like microarchitectural problems, transient execution, 
which concerns the out of order uh, execution. And I put several names here, and most of you know, know Spectre and Meltdown, and there are a number of other, or, or, or Foreshadow, which is also very interesting. You also know, uh, may know several other names because all these authors, they give cool names to their papers. And sometimes these names are much more creative than the content of the paper. So no insult to anyone, just to say that there is of course always a beginning and then there are some followers like in Twitter, yeah? I also put two or three other aspects of hardware, which are Volt Pole and Planda Volt, which are, which are fault injection attacks. They are not side channel, cache side channel attacks. They're fault injection, which is another amazing line of research that use software to attack the CPU. Uh, Volt Pole is from uh, my group. Planda Volt is a collaboration between uh, several universities, amongst others called KU Cal Leuven and, and Graz. Also, I put raw hammer because this is a fundamental hardware flaw that is exploited by software. Anyway, what is important to know is that hardware cannot be patched in silicon. Once you have the silicon, you can do some patches if you find some uh, uh, problems after fabrication. But all hardware guys know or ladies know that it is not possible for bigger things to really to have a sustainable solution. We will look for sustainable solutions. So let us go through the attacks that are more or less based on transient execution or by using meltdown and spectre as so to say a function. So you have this function meltdown, function spectre, and you put them together with other techniques or put even both of them together, composition of different attacks to achieve certain goals. Let us go through some of the interesting of them. So meltdown uh, attack is that you write, you, you, the adversary runs the code in its own context. So the adversary kind of puts the code somewhere or it is already there, which is used as out of order execution. I don't go through that because I, I think Torsten do, do not, would not give me that much time. But if you have questions, you can always contact me. So this out of order execution allows you to access those things, those information that are already put in buffers and caches and forgotten to be erased or flushed out. So meltdown attacks. So using the meltdown attack, they could use L1 cache to or misuse L1, exploit L, uh, L1 cache to extract the key from the quoting enclave. And this is, I think, the, the point where we come to the uh, victim part of SGX. First, it was celebrated. Now it is going to be a victim because as soon as you access the quoting uh, enclave, which, which is going to actually, so to say, confirm that other enclaves are real, and as soon as you have to access to this uh, signing key, you can fake everything. Of course, Intel has fixed that very fast, but the fact that it was possible, that means the assumption is now killing the cause. So the assumption of, yes, this is out of scope, but now I make SGX, the most sophisticated blah, blah, and then I put it on the market, and I give you guarantees. And all of a sudden somebody comes from Q Leuven and said, hello, I have the signing key. Yeah, no matter if they have the whole lead of it or not, but they have signing key, yeah. So that is killing the cause. So another, as another uh, attack tries not to use the uh, caches because maybe caches are too uh, noisy or can be fixed very fast in case of foreshadow attack, but you can mistrain, for example, the return stack buffer. This is a buffer in the, in the CPU where uh, you, can, you can manipulate the next branching, yeah? And as soon as you can manipulate the next branching, you can use Spectre gadget because Spectre is a vulnerability. So to say kind of vulnerability 
inside the enclave. So you you put the uh, uh, the, the so it's a return address or an address there where spectral gadget can be triggered inside the enclave and leak information to outside the enclave. And don't forget that spectral gadget is again a transient execution gadget. A gadget is a function, a set of instructions that you put together to, uh, to emulate or to uh, realize a specific function for a task, yeah? Other uh, use uh, transient execution to leak data from CPU internal buffer. So what they do is that they take, uh, for example, meltdown, put some wrong value in the, in the uh, buffer, and these are not caches because when, for example, L1 cache flashes the data, sometimes they store this data in this internal CPU uh, buffer. And there you can change it or access it. And when you have that and you use, uh, so to say, um, um, this transient execution um, attack, then you can leak information from, uh, from other, so to say, from enclave to outside enclave. And there are also a combination of, of meltdown attack, which is called reveals meltdown, where again, you, you use meltdown to uh, uh, change a value in the buffer. And this value is used again by a spectra gadget to run an attack inside the enclave to leak information towards outside. So these are some uh, attacks that I showed you. Once were on, on, on the side of side channel attacks and the other ones were on the side of transient execution, which is a micro architectural flaw that uses exploits, of course, caches as well, okay? So, and we are going to go beyond that, yeah? There is also a line that goes beyond this microarchitecture uh, flaws. So you may ask, hey, but there are so many researchers, they must have some solutions. Yes, they have. And this is some, some of them, I put them together, some of the most known software-based solutions. So side channel resilient software design. So cryptographers among you, the practical ones, they know that people write, there are lots of cryptographic algorithms and libraries written in such a way that they are not, uh, re they are resilient to side channel attack. There's masking techniques and many, many others. And I have myself, as I was in Bochum, a number of papers with Christoph Paz group and also my uh, um, uh, team on this aspect. Uh, however, this constant time implementation has a, uh, it is interesting for a simple cryptographic algorithm because they are really simple, but put it on an AI algorithm, put it on a, a genomic sequencing algorithm, as I was explaining, and put it on every algorithm. So you have to rewrite all algorithms. You cannot do that, okay? Then there is monitoring for attack effects. So that means you have a monitor in hardware, but, or in software, but wherever you put it, you need to give this monitor enough privileges and you also need to stop the attack, the stop, stop the execution if the attack is detected. And the, on the other hand, how do you handle the false positives? And this is where machine learning now is they coming in because everybody likes machine learning. Everybody loves machine learning. Everybody loves blockchain. So I guarantee you, I do not talk about blockchain in this talk, but machine learning, I have to say some, some, some stuff about it because it may be useful here to understand the traces, but still it is a real CPU. That is a different thing. Then you have oblivious execution or oblivious RAM. The cryptographers love oblivious RAM because they think it is useful. And I think oblivious RAM is an amazing concept. In 80s, as it, was pro, uh, as it was suggested by, because I did my PhD in cryptography, so I did a lot with uh, ORAM some years ago. And in 80s, they, Ostrovsky and, and Goldreich, they, they pro, uh, proposed this, which is of course linear complexity, is, is a huge amount of uh, um, effort to implement that in a system that the system will be uh, not useful. Many years later, people brought this, this complexity to, Let's say logarithmic complexity, complexity. be very, very, very uh, 
not to insult anyone, be very, very optimistic. However, if you use ORAM, ORAM has a state that the, and the state must be somewhere. Where do you put the state? You need to secure that state against side channel attacks. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of devil circle. So you cannot come out of that. So you, you have these, you have to solve these problems. Now, let us go to some hardware uh, solutions. Temporal cache authorization. So flushing cache, when you context switch, flush the cache and the cache is empty, nobody can access, nobody has any uh, interesting information. On it. However, this is not really useful in the context when you have multi-threading because the other thread can see. Uh, cache partitioning and coloring, some systems have, have used that. And these are systems that are, are getting more and more, but depending on how you implement it, you can be very inefficient and you can be maybe more efficient, but it is still something that uh, is seen as a problem specific, specifically by industry. Randomized cache mapping, that the hardware does a randomization at the beginning, for example, but how about the entropy? How about the frequency analysis? that have been attacked these systems. So it is not really all satisfactory, but of course, research is, is the, the good thing that we can do research and write papers about it. So where to go? One, one aspect is let's do all these things open source. We have done some good experience with open source software. Why not with open source hardware? So this is why I put here is risk five. This is one of the initi uh, initiatives. Is risk five a risk? which is risk here with K or future. So, and I think risk five has the, the potential to be the uh, future if capitalism does not screw it up, yeah? So, because hardware is not like software that everybody can sit on it and do it. Hardware needs a lot of skills and knowledge. So what is risk five? It's a royalty free uh, instruction set. It promises cheaper development. Even big market players are getting into this area. And they, of course, the core is for, for is open, but then companies provide the, their own IPs on top of it. They'll make it faster, make it more interesting, make it for this application, that application. So, but it is also very good for startups who want to do hardware. So let us go through some of the uh, designs of, on, uh, on um, risk fives, security architectures or enclave architectures. First of all is Sanctum. I call the beta SGX. So Sanctum was started directly after some attacks came up on an SGX. And then uh, Shinni Devades, who is the, uh, my colleague and uh, friend and professor there in, at MIT, he started this with one of his students, a long, long uh, uh, term project, which was very interesting. And as you see, the risk five, they provide here, they have, uh, you have in risk five architecture, three levels, user level, supervisor level, machine level. And here you see user level enclaves. So these are uh, protected uh, enclaves. And you see here a security monitor, I will come to that. So it produces enclaves at a user level, OS manages enclaves. There is a security monitor that checks any, any decision of OS goes through the security monitor, which is a very small, uh, um, software component which must be trusted and then they, uh, they change the logic of MNU to do some access control for accessing the memory and the cache side channel protection is by the so-called page coloring however page coloring needs a, it's it's not efficient uh, for for practical systems but that was the first step towards a good thing yeah and uh, then we had Keystone, that is also very well known, uh, enclave architecture on, on, on RISC V. As you see now, we have a runtime enclave. Yeah. Imagine that you have, for example, your drivers here inside the, uh, the enclave, in addition to a user enclave. And then here, the enclaves contain user and supervisor level, Enclave runtime provides thread and page table uh, management. Uh, these enclaves are protected by something which is called physical memory protection. It really, it is configured by a security monitor, but it 
it is really protecting physical memory. It doesn't allow anything that is kind of uh, fishy when it comes to protecting uh, enclave memory. And as you see, the security monitor itself is in uh, enclave. Okay, so one PMP region is reserved for each active enclave. That is, uh, so PMP is really for the core and for the, uh, for the enclave. So, and the cache partitioning, or let's say the, the, the cache protection, is that the so-called cache ways are uh, assigned to processor cores. This is a very coarse-grained uh, um, cache partition, more efficient than page coloring. Now I come to Cure, which is a work that we have been doing, and um, it, it is with a very large IT company. We are trying to implement it for the practice. And I hope that you will see it in products. So here we have, again, different kind of enclaves, but we added more types of enclaves because this is what you, you need to consider when you work with big companies. Engineers are sitting in a basement, no light, only burgers and gummy bear and cola. They develop fantastic things. Then they go to uh, higher floors of the company and there's very business units where there's light, big offices, nicely. And then they say, no, you can't sell this, go back. So they send them back to their basement and then they do, they do, they do. So, but sometimes they forget both business development, uh, business uh, uh, units and the engineers the range of application. How do you know it? Because emerging application coming after and after. So you need to have kind of prognosis. And this is what we learned in all these years that different applications, different software needs different stuff. You don't have to push it all in one platform, but you need to be prepared for it. So this is why we added the enclave runtime, but also an enclave, which is, as you see, this is a firmware that in, for example, Keystone and others is the whole firmware is, is here I showed as a security monitor. Here we want to have a very small security monitor and the rest of the firmware, so this, this, this security monitor will be in an enclave and the, the firmware, the rest of the firmware that don't need to trust. And another thing that was, was kind of pain in our neck is the, kind of access to the peripherals. We want secure channel. None of the none of the other provides a secure channel. Assume that you have here a hardware an accelerator for, for, I don't know, for AI, for example, yeah? You want a, an enclave to be devoted to this AI, to this chip, so and no other software can access it. So this is why we put a filter engine on the bus so that you can have secure channels to peripherals. This is of course a very abstract view of the architecture. This is one of the, and their implementation is getting much better and better and faster and faster. And it's, this is for example, where you can run a whole uh, uh, hypervisor. And so we added, you can add a, a, sorry, this is wrong here. It is a hypervisor level that you, can run a hypervisor and a virtual uh, uh, machine and the application in, inside an enclave. We don't need to change anything. So these are the, uh, uh, let's say, good things that we can do with this. So we use for, for cache partitioning, we use also a weight based cache. So that means cache uh, uh, ways are uh, as, uh, assigned to the, uh, to the enclaves, but this is also, this is much more flexible as page coloring, but still it is not very fine grain. It is cache ways. So we discussed and we found, let's say, we needed a more improved the flexible cache architecture that I'm not going to explain all of it, but if you, if you see here, these are the cache, let's say you have the so-called cache ways and you have cache sets. And what we are doing with this hide cache and uh, uh, and a new one that I'm going to talk about it in uh, 30 seconds is that you can divide the work world. So if you have a software that it is not non-critical, it can take the cache as it is taking it now. But as soon as you have a security critical workload, you can of course 
And so this is for non-critical. You can, of course, use this, the so-called what we call it orthogonal subcache that is provided to security critical work workload. So that means it is a hybrid. Uh, we call it hybrid sets associated with cache because non-critical work, uh, workload behaves as normal. Security critical workload utilizes only those, so to say, a cache subset, which is, which is called fully associative cache. That means you do not have a fixed relation between physical memory and cache, yeah? But I think I don't go to the details. This is uh, what we are now putting on this cure and a very uh, interesting thing about it is that the application at runtime can decide for it. The idea is to let the application decide. I want security, so I go for this. I don't want security, I go for other one. You can also configure your, your so to say, memory controller, so to say, to uh, provide this side channel resilience just by deciding, yes, I want it or I don't want it. So this is a binary decision, but you can make it even more fine grained. And this is done in a new uh, uh, cache architecture that is upcoming in Usenix 2022 next year, where you have a, you have a set base. That means this is not only way based, it is, uh, it is not way based, it is set based, which is give you much more options for uh, your cache usage. So I don't go through the evaluation because these evaluations, so you see what is change uh, of lines, very small changes to community OS, very small, we, you need a, we made a kernel module to have interface with a security module. <coughs> and we had an extra uh, crypto library for that, uh, added to that. Performance overhead for hardware uh, based on, uh, so okay, this is a performance overhead compared to the case where, uh, where user level enclave is running or supervisor uh, level enclave is running or, or together with user uh, level enclave. User level enclave needs um, an, a bit more uh, administration. So you have uh, this kind of, so let's say some percentage of, of uh, uh, penalty. And these are the hardware overhead. If you want to do it, for example, on FPGA, this is a typical way of, of providing the, the uh, hardware overhead. And as you see here, it is relative. So what is our base model? Our base model of a rocket chip, and which is a risk five chip. And it is based on, for example, our base model was rocket chip with two cores. So they have multi cores. So it was a kind of baby example, which is enough for a, for a conference, but it is not enough for a product. Yeah, I mean, everybody knows that product has a more, much, much harder line uh, to go than only a paper. So this is why these numbers do not work now. So uh, why? Because we have changed the implementation together with our partner because they have lots of developers and this, this, this is the uh, difference to these numbers. So this is a kind of comparison between all these things and uh, if you want to put in a paper and brag about it, oh, here we have user level enclaves, uh, we have in process enclaves. That means, yeah, you have firmware and part of it is security monitor. You can put them in, put the security monitor in enclave while, while the other one is not in enclave. That means at machine level, we have enclaves as well. And the enclave peripheral binding, which are very important. So if you want to go further, go from one component, one CPU, one SOC to others, that means you have to go towards the network on chip. Network on chip is when a number of components like GPUs, secure processors, and all of them are connected to each other to provide a huge now amount of efficiency. And here uh, we recently built with the uh, collaborators in, in Boston and Arizona, we built a um, kind of enclave computing based on risk five architectures for network on chip that I just wanted to mention to you if you are interested. So the last minutes of the talk, I would like to uh, report about something that maybe some of you know, because uh, Bochum was one of the winners uh, in, in a competition that I'm going to talk about is the next level threat beyond microarchitectural attacks. 
What does it mean? So we started in 2018 with an event which is called Hackett Event um, in a big conference, a system conference, which is called, Hack, uh, which is called uh, uh, Design Automation Conference, DAC. And this security uh, uh, competition was in collaboration with Intel at the beginning. And now it's getting more companies are coming uh, uh, and joining us where we took hardware. So let me show you. So this is, a, for example, RISC-V hardware. We take a, a number of existing hardware bugs. We injected that into it. And then we took also, so these are all real world bugs. And we also encountered real world bugs that amazingly and very astonishingly were provided by Intel to us, or they put it in the, in the SOC, which were those bugs that are very critical bugs. That means you can exploit them from software. It is not hardware, it's hardware bugs, but you can exploit them from software that were discovered before fabrication, short before fabrication, because all these semiconductor companies have lots of lots of expensive tools to verify uh, the functionality and also some part of the security as far as it's possible. So we had really professional help and we build bugs in various components from memory bus to cryptographic engines, to processor core units, to boot room. And then we looked for these four directions, denial of service. So an attack can provide, make CPU completely uh, uh, shut the CPU down, privilege escalation, sensitive information leakage or software exploitability directly so that you, immediately can exploit it. So this is uh, a, a bit more detail here. I don't want to go through it. I just want to give you one example. So at any part, we put a bug. Now the teams who were teams from academia or industry or a combination of it should find these bugs. And from the first competition, we had 30 bugs and the best team found 16 bugs. But let me give you an example why it goes beyond Marco architecture or, or, uh, um, or um, transit execution. So here bug number seven to make it more, more bureaucratically is memory access violation. So you see this advanced extensible interface. This is, let me go back. So there, there is a bus here the, that this interface is for the bus now. If you, uh, let me see, okay. So if the, it has a state machine, this state machine, if it ignores a certain order of memory accesses, then the problem that is uh, created is that a faulty transaction. So once if uh, the state machine forgets that this access or the order of the access. So once it, there is an access that it is uh, 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 not eligible, the state machine forgets this and then allows the next not eligible access to be possible. But you know, you first you think, okay, it doesn't keep state. What's the point? The point is that you can run a massive attack just by controlling this bus, because this interface is very important. All information that is going over the bus, a very, really very hard to find bug. And then there is another bug that I want to mention to you because we put these bugs in a RISC-V SOC. We could not put the CPU of Intel because it is a big uh, secret. Some of the teams, they found bugs in the risk five that we, be, we did not inject. As I always, I always mention that in every talk, it's getting boring because I was fascinated by that. They found, for example, here incorrect computation because the clock was wrong. Yeah, there's a faulty logic of the clock that allows you to set back, to do ro uh, rollback or all the digital rights management or certificate revocation aspects, they do not work at all. Yeah, you can, you can mess with it. So 
One of the teams, of course, in, in one year, I think it was two, uh, 219 or 220, it was Bochum. Bochum was at the, uh, the first place. I was very proud of them, actually. Uh, good people from Bochum. And this is, for example, up to 2020. I didn't uh, put 21 because more conferences. First, it was Hack, 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 and then I uh, asked, uh, and then I was approached by some people in Usenix, and then we started with Usenix, then we, we were approached by by uh, chess and we are not doing it uh, with chess as well. So the purpose is to uh, what we do is that we focus on how these bugs are, are uh, the teams must explain how they found, found, uh, found these bugs. The teams must also uh, uh, encounter the fact that we are making in each competition different box. Sometimes we keep the same box, but we don't tell the teams. Uh, now you know it and sometimes we add new bugs, but they are getting more complicated each time. And depending on the conference, either they can they must exploit it, for example, for Usenix, or they must uh, do, for example, uh, crypto uh, uh, chain, so to attack the crypto algorithm before, for example, for chess. So, and uh, the insight that we had was so tremendous that we are continuing. And now uh, uh, Synapsis and uh, other companies are joining and it's getting bigger. And so I'm very happy with the development here. This is some bragging about what we were in the uh, uh, news all over the world. And this is why I also encourage you to participate because Bochum is very good and they will definitely get a place uh, in, among the th three best uh, uh, teams. So what we, are now, we have done last year or this year actually is that we put all of these things into Amazon. Uh, web services. That means you can automatically contact Amazon Web Services and uh, work with, uh, so the, 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 the emulation of, of the SOC is inside the uh, virtual machine. So the last minute, and I'm finished now, is about research directions. So no risk, no fun. If you want to do research, I think in now in the, in at this, um, stage of my personal career, I want to do things that I always wanted to do, but had never time for it. And uh, one of them is I want to build an SOC which has adaptive security. This is not only the new idea, but there are some new aspects in it that I have never seen somewhere else, so that you can indeed reconfigure your SOC, which is fabricated and shipped out even after fabrication. The next thing that I would like to do, and I'm doing of course, uh, currently is what we call trusted configurable computing. Imagine, and this is for example, uh, when you talk about configurability, people immediately think of FPGA. In this case, it is indeed could be FPGA because FPGA clouds where also Bochum is very strong in, for example, side channel attacks on, on FPGAs uh, in cloud. Um, and it is a different attack setting because you can do a denial of service on a hardware in a remote platform by, by, having, a by having a malicious code in your FPGA that configures the, uh, the hardware in such a way that you can change the voltage and you can completely destroy the, uh, uh, the, the platform, the FPGA. And I'm not talking about multi-tenant FPGA, which is more a, a academic fantasy. I'm talking about a single FPGA, single client, yeah? So I call this bring your own trust anchor. So imagine a world that I can inject my trust anchor to any remote platform under certain assumption and under certain cryptographic protocols. So combining cryptography with system security, which is a trend in, in the research community, but now with trust anchor. And if you can do that, you may be able to prove some theorems that have been proved under very strong assumptions in the context of secure multi-party computation. But you can do it in reality. It is not just a cryptographic fantasy, yeah? Um, so another aspect is, of course, after having this uh, um, long term, let's say for us three, four years is long term, even on the pandemic teams were competing, is that we need novel vulnerability detection for hardware, novel schemes. And Torsten knows that, for example, Torsten is involved in also in an Intel project on 
hard the fuzzing that would be one direction, one, one direction, but also combining information flow mechanisms with fuzzing because the industrial verification tools have their limit. We used verification tools, formal verification tools during this competition and a number of uh, very severe bugs could not be found while the groups, the academic industry joint groups, they could find it. Human mind, real intelligence, not artificial intelligence. That is amazing. Okay, thank you very much.